I think that the biggest fear that most first time home buyers have is trying to figure out whether or not they're even going to qualify for a home in the first place. And that entire process really starts with getting pre-approved for a mortgage. So on today's video, I've partnered up with my friends over at Money Under 30 to give you guys the absolute best tips and tricks that I've got to make sure that you guys can get pre-approved to buy your first home this year. Coming up. Welcome back to the channel. My name's Kayton. I'm a loan officer from San Diego, California. And on this channel, I help people just like you learn how to buy their first home and navigate the mortgage process. If at any point during the video, you've got a question, leave it in the comments down below. If you learned something new, make sure you hit that like button. If you want to see more content just like this, hit subscribe and ring that bell so you get notified every time I post more content. All right, so getting pre-approved for a mortgage, right? That's where your entire home buying journey really should start. A lot of first-time home buyers will probably go on sites like Zillow and Redfin, Trulia, maybe work with a realtor and start looking at some homes first before they even consider their finances. But that's probably one of the biggest mistakes you can make because you wanna make sure that your finances are in order and that you can even afford to buy the home in the first place before you go out and shop. Now, I know it can be scary to be talking to a loan officer, to be talking to anyone really about your finances because for most people, it's a very personal and private thing. And I'm gonna be honest, your lender is gonna probably find out more about your finances than even you knew. But I promise the entire process is super important to make sure that you can comfortably afford that new mortgage payment so you can worry about living in your dream home instead of affording your dream home. All right, now let's start with what lenders even look at during the pre-approval process. For me, I like to simplify it down to just three things, income, assets, and credit. Let's start with income. When we're getting you qualified for a mortgage, we're using your gross income. That's your income before taxes and everything else is taken out. This means if you're a regular W-2 employee, this is your income before taxes. If you're self-employed, it's a little bit trickier because you have all these different deductions. Usually it's your effective income after deductions. That's what your taxes are usually calculated on. So once again, your income before taxes, but after deductions if you're self-employed. Now what's great is a lot of times you can have a co-signer. For example, if you're married, you have your spouse as a co-signer on the loan, and we're going to use your gross household income. So make sure you're keeping this in mind. Try to consider everyone in your household who's going to be living in the house. Consider using their income and using them as a co-signer to help you qualify for this mortgage. Now, if you don't have a co-signer, that's fine too. There's a lot of people who have helped throughout the years who literally just bought their homes by themselves. So it never hurts to try. Now, income is probably one of the most important pieces to getting pre-approved because this is really going to dictate how much you can afford. So if you want to make sure that you can even afford the home that you want to live in, start budgeting. As a good baseline, your mortgage payment should be anywhere between 30 to 35% of your gross income. Now, when I refer to mortgage payment here, that's just your principal and interest payment. The reason why is I know a bunch of you are living in different cities, different states, might be looking at different properties. 30 to 35% for just the mortgage, principal and interest payment, is going to be a good baseline for you to figure out how much you can realistically afford because once you start adding on those property taxes and insurance on top of that the payment gets a little bit more expensive keep in mind also your finances might be different 30 to 35 percent of someone's gross income who's making five thousand dollars a month is way different than someone who's making fifty thousand dollars a month so keep that in mind now another note on income that i get asked all the time is you need two years of job history but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be at the same job for two years as long as you're more or less in the exact same field for the last two years, or you've shown career growth over the last two years, you're more than fine to be jumping between jobs. In fact, this is actually a good thing, especially if you're showing that your income is increasing as you move from company to company while still staying in the same field. The same rule applies if you're a business owner. We're gonna need at least two years of tax returns. And if your tax returns are showing that your income is increasing year over year, this is definitely gonna help you qualify for a loan as well. Now, a trickier thing here is if you're trying to use your overtime, bonus income, or commissions to qualify, you have to average this over a 24 month period. This means if you've only just recently started receiving commissions or bonuses, you might not be able to use as much of that income to help you qualify. Lastly, a job isn't the only kind of effective income that you can have as well. Things like child support or alimony, um, stocks, bonds, capital gains. You can use all these different kinds of things as effective income if it's properly documented over the last two years. All right, now let's start talking about credit. This is probably the second biggest question I get asked when talking about mortgages is what kind of credit score do I need to even qualify for a home loan? Well, it really depends on the kind of program that you're going for. Uh, as a general guideline, if you're applying for things like FHA or VA loans, you're going to need at least a 580. As a general rule of thumb, if you're over 640, you're pretty much good for majority of the programs out there. But as far as the minimum FICO scores, here's a list of all the minimum FICO scores that you're going to need for different kinds of programs. Now a big tip that I can give you when it comes to monitoring your credit score, 
don't use Credit Karma. I know it's free, but it's usually free for a reason. Credit Karma makes their money by giving you a different kind of scoring model. They use the Vantage score model, where we use the FICO model when it comes to mortgage lending. So the scores that they're showing you on Credit Karma can be sometimes 20, 30, 40 points higher or lower than what your actual credit score is. It's not very accurate. Not to mention the fact that Credit Karma is always trying to upsell you on taking out you know, debt consolidation loans, applying for new credit cards. If you continue to go down that rabbit hole, you can end up hurting your odds of getting a pre-approved instead of helping it. Instead, I highly recommend things like MyFICO. They are much more accurate or maybe even going directly to the source with places like Experian, Equifax, or TransUnion. They've got credit monitoring as well. It's not free, but if you're really concerned about monitoring your credit for buying a home, I highly recommend using one of those tools. Now, you can't talk about credit without talking about debts. I think it goes without saying that the less debt you have, the more likely you're gonna get approved for more. But here's why. Once again, going back to income, your debt to income ratio is gonna be the biggest factor when it comes to figuring out your purchasing power. Now, what's great is most lenders will let you go as high as 45 to 50% debt to income ratio, depending on the program that you're using, but obviously the less debt you have, the more you'll be able to afford. I typically like to recommend to my clients to start paying down that high interest debt, the ones with higher payments. Those larger decks are really going to make a bigger impact on your purchasing power than anything else. But that doesn't mean that you should ignore those smaller debts too. You see, for every $50 a month in debt that you can knock out, that gives you an extra $10,000 in purchasing power on average. So for example, paying off a car payment that's $500 a month could give you $100,000 more in purchasing power. So you really wanna look at your budget and really start prioritizing those higher payments, but also don't leave off those small ones if you can knock those out too. All right, now what about student loans? Now, this is a very common issue that I have, especially as more millennials continue to enter the buying space. Believe it or not, student loans aren't the deal killer that they used to be when it came to mortgages. In fact, lots of mortgage providers like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, even FHA, have become a lot more flexible with how they're treating student loans. Now, it really depends on how much student debt that you have, but for the most part, it's actually pretty easy to qualify for a mortgage, even with a little bit of student debt. Alrighty, and now the last one, and probably the biggest one, cash. How much money do you need to actually buy a home? First of all, you need to understand how much of a down payment you're going to need. If you're using things like a VA loan or a USDA loan, congratulations, you need 0% down. If you're using an FHA loan, you're gonna need 3.5% down, and a conventional loan, you're gonna need 3 to 5% down. Now what's great is a lot of these programs can be paired with a down payment assistance program, so it could take these costs all the way down to zero in some cases. But just because you have your down payment covered doesn't mean that there aren't other costs buying a home too. These things are called closing costs. Now, on average, the closing cost for a home is going to be anywhere between 2 to 3% of the purchase price, depending on the area that you're living in. Honestly, the biggest part of your closing costs isn't even going to be the stuff for your lender or the title or escrow company. Usually, the biggest portion of your closing costs is going to be going towards your property taxes. And it can get pretty expensive, including in places here like San Diego, California, uh, places like Austin, Texas, places where they have really high property tax rates. So as a baseline for most home buyers, I like to say have anywhere between five to 7% set aside for your down payment and your closing costs, because this is gonna cover you for a majority of the programs that you might be looking at. So here's a quick example of how much you're going to need to buy a $500,000 home. Let's say you're gonna use 5% down using a conventional loan. That's gonna be $25,000. On top of that, you're gonna have your closing costs. That's gonna be another $10,000. So right at the gate, you're at about $35,000. And now that we've covered how much cash that you're going to need, I wanna talk about where that cash needs to actually be coming from. You're gonna hear the term cash to close get thrown a lot by both real estate professionals and mortgage professionals. But really, we're not talking about cold hard cash, we're talking about cash that's been properly sourced. Typically, the most common place that home buyers have their cash is in a checkings or a savings account. If you're watching this video right now and you plan on buying this here, I would definitely recommend start depositing that cash immediately. Some other acceptable sources of a down payment uh, that might actually surprise you or include things like your 401k from work, uh, if you're in the military, your TSP account, stocks and bonds, IRA, if you sell something and you have a deed of sale, you can use those proceeds as well. There's plenty of places that you can use cash or get cash from in order to close on a property. One of the more common things I'm seeing right now is people getting gifts from relatives in order to buy their home. Now, this usually has to be a direct relative. You're talking, you know, brother, sister, cousin, uh, aunt, uncle, mom and dad, obviously. So make sure that you're getting it from a proper source. But gift funds are also an acceptable source for both of your down payment and your closing costs. All right, so you know exactly how much you need to make. You know what kind of credit and what kind of debts that you have to worry about. And you know how much money you need to close on your home. So what kind of documents are you going to need to bring with you to that pre-approval meeting? 
Once again, if you're a typical W-2 employee, you're just gonna need your last two years of W-2s, the last 30 days of pay stubs, and two months of bank statements, and a photo ID. For majority of people, that's basically all you're going to need. Now, if you're a business owner, you're gonna need a little bit more. You're obviously gonna need your ID, you're gonna need two years of tax returns, and in some cases, you might need to actually bring your business bank statements on top of your personal bank statements. And I think it goes without saying that if credit is a factor in getting pre-approved, you're going to need to have your credit run. The good news is mortgage inquiries don't hurt your credit the same way things like a credit card inquiry might. It will, in fact, your score. It is a hard pull. It's gonna be about one to three points off your score on average. Uh, what's great is it opens up a shopping window where you have about 45 days to shop around for a mortgage with other lenders. Now, what I typically recommend is get pre-approved by about two or three different people because some lenders have what are called overlays, which are limitations on how much you can actually get pre-approved for. For example, one lender might have an overlay for your debt to income ratio of just 43%, where another lender might let you go up to 50. So make sure you check with your lenders, ask them if they have overlays or if they write directly to the guidelines. This way you'll figure out if you're actually getting the most out of your purchasing power. For the most part, if you've got your documents and you've got your finances in order, getting pre-approved is no big deal. But knowing what you need and knowing at least the minimums of where you need to get to can be a huge help if you're not quite ready to buy a home yet. One of the best tips I can also give you guys is even if you're not trying to buy a home in the next one or two months, you should still consider meeting with a mortgage lender and getting pre-approved anyways. In doing so, your lender is gonna be able to help you flush out the areas where your application might be a little bit deficient and kind of give you a roadmap on what you need to fix in order to get pre-approved. I can't tell you how many times I've met with potential first-time home buyers who are coming to me right at the end of their lease only to find out that it's gonna take them another three to six months to fix something on their credit or save up money for a down payment when they thought that they were ready to buy a home today. So ultimately they had to sign up for another lease and go right back to renting. So meeting with a mortgage lender as early as you can in the process is probably gonna be one of the biggest keys that I can give you to make sure that you can buy a home this year. Now, if you have any specific questions on getting pre-approved, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And if you're in California, go ahead and click the link in the description below and we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one call so I can help you get pre-approved to buy your first home in California this year. Now, once again, if you learned something new, make sure you hit that like button. If you wanna see more content just like this, hit subscribe and ring that bell. Here's a few more videos that I think are gonna help you along your home buying journey. And until next time, see you later, bye.